right, guys, next section, section 10, grounding and bonding. Probably one of the most important uh, sections in the code. Uh, let's start off with the first rule here. Uh, so the first section here is going to be scope, object, and special terminology. And uh, first code rule here is obviously 10-000. Uh, it's the scope of section 10. Uh, so the section applied to um, grounding as follows, being solidly grounded systems, impedance grounded systems, and ungrounded systems. Uh, and it's in terms of bonding and equal, equal potential bonding. So it's interesting, this, like this one slide now took me like a couple hours to uh, create all the stuff that goes along with, uh, with these terms here. So let's first talk about what a solidly grounded system is. So a solidly grounded system uh, would be something similar to the panel in your house. It's solidly grounded uh, where the neutral of the system is directly connected to ground without introducing any intentional resistance into the ground circuit. So we'll see with the next one, impedance ground systems, there's certain grounds where they actually put uh, a resistor or a, a, or a coil uh, in order to limit the, the fault currents. In this case, it's a solidly ground system similar to the panel in your house where you have your, uh, your grounding conductor going to a grounding electrode or where you have like a, a transformer. Secondary of the transformer, uh, the neutral is going to be bonded to ground. Uh, and then that ground is going to be um, is going to be eventually going to the main bo main ground for the uh, for the building. So advantages of a solidly gra solidly grounded system where the neutral is directly connected to the ground without any resistance in the ground circuit uh, is that uh, the ground faults are if the ground faults are on one on one of the phases, the voltage in the other phases that reference that ground are not going to increase. So if you have a fault that goes to ground, right, line to ground, uh, the other line, say if you have a three-phase system and the neutral is, uh, is grounded, if you have a fault from line to ground on that three-phase system and it's a solidly grounded system, the other two lines are not going to change potential. Right? It's not going to be like where we have an open neutral or anything like that where one voltage goes high and one voltage goes low. On the in a fault current, the other two, uh, they're saying phases, but they could also say lines, the other two phases or lines are going to remain at their reference voltage in comparison to ground. Um, this allows for the overcurrent devices to trip quickly because of that low impedance path to ground. Like we're looking for something that's you know close to one ohm of resistance, really low resistance in order for it to get high fall currents to happen, you know, not for an extended period of time, but high fall currents to happen so that our uh, our overcurrent devices such as our fuses and our breakers are going to trip quickly. Okay, so this allows us to identify the faulted cir circuit immediately. Obviously, if the breaker or the fuse goes, we know which line it was. Uh, disadvantages are that there's no resistance in that line, right? So it's a disgustingly low uh, resistance, right? A low impedance path in order to get high currents to flow. So you're gonna have higher fault currents, um, and especially in higher voltage systems, uh, they may not allow you to have a solidly grounded system because of the disgustingly high currents that can happen uh, on any faults there. Okay, so solidly grounded system is a neutral that is grounded. Okay, next one is impedance grounded systems. Uh, this is something that I don't have very much background in. I'd like to learn more about. Um, impedance ground, ground systems uh, have a grounded impedance device, usually a resistor, but could be a coil, uh, between the neutral point and the earth in order to limit your ground fall currents. So this limits the amount of thermal stress on equipment and improves safety. Uh, impedance ground systems are common in utility distribution systems and industrial plants in circuits, uh, usually over a thousand volts. So the diagram there um, is from, I put all the links here uh, for the diagrams for to, if you'd like to learn more uh, in different articles. Um, so it's a pretty good diagram here. We've got a Y system here. The Y is then tied into, uh, into ground. So the neutral is grounded, but it does have a resistor in line here in order for uh, that fault current to be limited. There are rules which we'll go over for impedance grounded systems. Um, they have to be serviced by uh, qualified individuals and they also need to have a ground fault uh, detector as well. Right, this alarm that's that's there as well, so that it, it tells you that uh, that a fault has happened there. Okay, so solidly ground systems with the neutral was bonded directly to ground, 
I'm using the wrong word, the neutral was grounded um, directly without any resistance. In this case, uh, impedance grounded systems, the neutral is grounded, but in line, in series with that neutral, before it gets to earth, uh, there's either a resistor or there's a, uh, some type of coil. Okay, then we're moving on to ungrounded systems. So ungrounded systems, uh, reading up on this, this actually is um, above my pay grade as well. So I went with the easiest one, I went with a delta, but there's other ungrounded systems um, for communication systems and stuff that are a little bit more complicated than what I've seen in the field. Uh, a ground, ungrounded system would be something similar to uh, a delta. This is not uh, the delta where uh, one of the phases is, gra is uh, grounded. Uh, all three of these lines uh, do not have a reference to ground. So ungrounded systems are power systems with no intentionally applied grounding. Uh, however, they are grounded by the natural capacitance of the system to ground. So you have a conductor and even that, between that conductor and ground, you have the conductor, then you have the, the insulation, then you've got an air gap, then you've got ground. Essentially every conductor in that delta system is going to become a capacitor in comparison to your ground there. So with an ungrounded system, a ground fault does not immediately cause overcurrent devices to trip, which is great. It's an advantage in industrial plants, systems where a high continuity of service is important to minimize interruptions of expensive production processes. So in a delta circuit, if one of the lines uh, is faulted to ground, uh, then you don't have an overcurrent device that goes. You will have indicator lights that show that a, a fault has occurred and you need to tr uh, troubleshoot that and find that as quickly as possible before another ground fault uh, occurs that completes the path for that fault there. Uh, disadvantages are that ungrounded systems are subjected to high and destructive transient over voltages, which obviously present a, a hazard to personnel uh, and equipment. So with your choice, um, most systems are going to be grounded systems, solidly grounded systems up to about 600 volts, right, 122, 8, 347, 480, 600 volts, those will be uh, solidly grounded systems. And then when we're getting up above 1,000 volts, those are high fault currents, so they'll most likely be introducing impedance grounded systems. There are delta secondaries that are ungrounded systems. Uh, they're not used as much uh, as the uh, as a Y that would be uh, bonded to ground. Okay, so hopefully that covers uh, the term uh, for grounding. We have the other term uh, for bonding, but let's cover a little bit more on, on the grounding. I've got some, some diagrams here uh, as well. So uh, grounding is when we provide a conductive path from the source to the grounding electrode for solidly grounded or impedance grounded systems, or between non-current carrying metal enclosures to the grounding electrode for ungrounded systems. So if we're talking about solidly grounded or impedance grounded systems, uh, we're having a low impedance path from the source to the grounding electrode, from the neutral to the grounding electrode. Uh, and then if we're talking about like a delta or un, uh, ungrounded systems, then we're going to have a ground uh, between the non-current carrying enclosures and, uh, and earth. This provides a connection to the reference point that's considered to be at zero voltage. And this low impedance uh, path uh, provides a safe pathway for excessive electrical charges or fall currents to flow to earth and facilitates the operation of our overcurrent devices being fuse or breaker. So the grounding is the reference to ground. That's what's going to trip the, our fuses and breakers because we've provided that low impedance path uh, to ground there. So if any line touches ground, then we've got their grounding conductor and that grounding conductor will cause high currents to flow and the fuse or the breaker uh, will blow. Uh, note that the path must be capable of safely carrying the maximum ground fault current likely to be imposed on it from any point in the wiring system. So there's a minimum size for grounding conductors, right? And that's obviously based on the fact that that's our main uh, thing that keeps our system safe. So it has to have, you know, a lot of uh, current carrying capability so it has to be sized properly. And we'll talk about how to size those uh, later on. Right now, we're just talking about the, the terms grounding versus bonding. Okay, so grounding is essentially providing a reference to earth. Okay, key points about uh, grounding. 
So safety grounding also ensures that any stray voltages or electrical faults, obviously short circuits, have a safe path to dissipate, reducing the risk of electrical shock or fire. Right? So here we can see our main grounding electrode here, right? and that grounds our entire system. And our neutral is bonded to that main grounding conductor. The other thing that this does is it stabilizes voltages. So if your neutral is, uh, is grounded, then all lines that are in that circuit, you know, if you have single phase, then both will have 120 to ground. If we have a three phase system, then if it's a 1228 Y system, then again, we're gonna have 120 volts to ground on each of those lines. If that neutral or ground is lost, then all of a sudden we're gonna have um, differences in voltages. So by having a stable uh, and secure connection to ground, it helps uh, maintain a stable voltage level in the electrical system uh, by providing that common reference point helping to avoid fluctuations that could obviously damage sensitive equipment. And it protects uh, equipment. In the case of electrical faults, i.e. a short circuit, grounding helps divert the current away from sensitive devices, potentially protecting them from getting damaged. If we have one singular path to ground, then that current on fault will most likely take, we're hoping, will take the path of our grounding electrode and it won't be going through any other electrical equipment. Uh, then on the bottom here, how grounding works, a ground wire is connected to the system, then routed to a metal rod or plate buried in the earth, which provides a low resistance path for electrical current to flow safely. There's other means of creating um, you know, a ground connection. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, you know, a rod or a plate. There's ground, um, ground grids, there's also um, uh, things that we can put into the concrete, uh, but we'll go through those different terms in a little bit. And then it says in electrical circuits, grounding is usually used in conjunction with circuit breakers or fuses to obviously shut up the power in the event of a fault. Okay, here we can also see the difference between um, like bonding and grounding. You can see here that this box is bonded, right? So it's at the same potential as ground. Uh, but the grounding electrode conductor is the main thing that's going to allow our fault currents to go to ground and have the overcurrent devices trip as quickly as possible. Okay, so bonding is essentially keeping, well, we'll get to bonding in two seconds. Bonding is essentially keeping everything at an equal potential, whereas grounding is providing a low impedance path to earth so that our overcurrent devices uh, trip quickly and to stabilize our voltages. Okay, so hopefully that covers uh, grounding properly. Amazing how like one rule it can take, like, you know, extrapolate into so many different things. But these two terms are, are mixed up quite a bit. So I'm hoping that at the end of this quick little video that you'll understand the difference between grounding and bonding. Okay, so now let's get into bonding. In electrical circuits, bonding refers to the process of connecting all metal parts of an electrical system, such as metal enclosures, conduits, uh, and the grounding systems together using a copper bonding conductor to ensure that they are all the same or uniform electrical potential. So we want everything to be at the same touch potential, right? So in this case, if you're touching both this portion and this portion of this steel, they've created a bond between there, so they're all at the equal potential. All of our boxes will be bonded to ground so that every box and every metal fitting will be bonded to ground, right? They're all at the exact same potential, right? Here we can see in the inside of an electrical panel uh, that the neutral bus bar is bonded to the casing. So the casing of the actual panel is then at an equal potential of ground, right? We have moving magnetic fields that are caused by our sine waves that are causing you know, current to increase and decrease. They're causing magnetic fields to fluctuate at either 60 or 50 hertz, depending on where you're living, uh, but in North America, it's 60 hertz, and they're creating induced voltages. We want to make sure that those induced voltages are, <clears throat> are then bled off to ground, and every piece of the electrical equipment is at the same potential, right? Here we can see here that uh, we have a bond between the, uh, the actual casing of the transformer, uh, We've got our bushing here, our, our bonding bushing. Uh, so everything's at the exact same uh, potential. We can also see uh, that this portion of the transformer, which is a non-current carrying um, portion, is also bonded 
to the casing. So everything is at the exact same potential. So bonding doesn't mean grounding. It doesn't mean it's providing a, so a, a connection to ground. It's, me it's meaning that every th piece of steel or metal or non-current carrying uh, components of our electrical system are all at the exact same potential. Last thing we want to do is touch two pieces of metal in our electrical system and then get a shock because they're at different potentials. So this brings us to a uniform electrical potential on everything. And it says it's done to prevent the buildup of dangerous voltages between different metal parts that cause electrical shock or damage. You know, there's capacitance that could come into play as well and, um, and static charges as well. So this allows capacitance, uh, capacitive and static charges to also dissipate as well. But essentially we're creating a uniform electrical potential. Uh, key points about bonding prevents voltage differences. So bonding ensures that all conductor parts, metal housing or electrical equipment, pipes, structural elements, being steel, girders and stuff, uh, in, the in the electrical and the building system are all electrically connected, preventing a situation where different parts of the system could have different electrical potentials. Without bonding, uh, if someone touches two parts of the system at different touch potentials, they could theoretically get shocked. Uh, obviously, safety bonding is an important safety measure because it ensures that any stray current, for example, due to a fault condition, is directly, safely, and uniformly through the system. So it's through our bonding that then ties into our grounding, right? So it, minim it, it minimizes the paths uh, for ground currents as well, right? Providing a path for uh, the fault currents should be on our grounding electrode, uh, but by bonding, we're also creating that equal potential there. Uh, and also prevent sparks. If you have two different components uh, that are in close proximity to, to each other and they have a high potential difference, then you can get a spark to jump across those two points, right? So minimize the sparking between uh, different non-current carrying components of our, uh, of our system. So bonding reduces the risk of sparks by ensuring that all metal, metallic parts are at the same electrical potential, which could otherwise create dangerous arcs or sparks uh, when touching. So I'll stop her there. Hopefully that covers uh, the basics of bonding and grounding. Uh, what I would do next is I would watch this, um, this video on, from Eden. So the link is right here. Um, if I'm placing this on YouTube, the link will be in the, in the comment section or the description of the video as well. I would highly recommend watching uh, this Eden video. It goes uh, through, I think it's a half hour long. Um, and it goes through the difference between bonding uh, and grounding in greater detail than what I've done here. Um, right now I'm just covering 10 differences between bonding and grounding. We're going to get through all the specifics within all the, the, uh, the other rules within uh, section 10. But at this point I would stop, watch that video for half an hour, and then move on with the other uh, rules in section 10. All right guys, I'll see you in the next video.